Hey everybody, welcome to the channel. Michael Noland here and tonight I finally get to do my review, my assessment of Led Zeppelin's excellent album, In Through the Outdoor. You know, this album was recorded in the latter part of 1978 in the months of November and December, but it was only recorded like its predecessor album, Presence, in about three weeks. It would be released in August of 1979, and after two weeks on the chart, it was the number one album on Billboard's top 100 album list. And you know, just like a preceding album, Physical Graffiti, when In Through the Outdoor was released, all of Led Zeppelin's albums started to rechart in the top 100 list. Now, as far as why Led Zeppelin named this album In Through the Outdoor, it was a personal statement. The band was in a tax exile situation. Robert had gone through a horrible car accident. Robert's son, Carrick, had died. The whole band seemed to be a bit in turmoil and even trying to go forward felt to them like going in through an outdoor. Now, unlike previous Led Zeppelin albums, this album has a very heavy John Paul Jones feel to it and a heavy John Paul Jones teaming up with Robert Plant feel to it as well. And you know, I think that's just one of the reasons why this album is such an interesting album to listen to. There is a different sound on this album. Now that alone shouldn't surprise us, right? I mean, after all, Led Zeppelin from time to time delivered us a completely different sound. But you know, with this being their last studio album as a living, live, band and with no new material coming from the band this would be basically their last studio album right it does tend to set aside from other led zeppelin albums whether it's your favorite or it's your least favorite and of course what i'm going to do as usual is get into a track by track analysis of this album all right so side one track one in the evening. You know, there is just such a wonderful phase effect to Robert's voice in this track. They spent a lot of time on the timing of that phase because they wanted his voice to sit really nice in the mix. You see, the perfect phasing allows them to bring his voice down. You get a more powerful band dynamic with this song as well as clearly hearing Robert's vocals and lyrics. You know, it only takes a casual listening to this song to know this is a great track. But you know, I do have some criticism on this track and a few others on this album. And just one of these criticisms is that Jimmy and Bonzo on this track, not a mistake played, nothing wrong with the playing, absolutely studio perfection. But that's my point. They service this song with such perfection that you're left to wonder, what happened to the song serving Jimmy Page? And what happened to the song serving Bonzo as well? Now, it's a fine song. It's a fine recording. It's just that I guess I miss that intimate and upfront, whatever it was that Jimmy and Bonzo had that easily identified Led Zeppelin recordings. All right, so that gets us to track two, Southbound Suarez, one of my favorite tracks on this album, no doubt. This is high octane, smokehouse blues driven, edgily recorded, and yet somehow a perfect studio recording as well. This song would have fit perfectly on physical graffiti, if you ask me. And you know, if there's any criticism to this entire track, it would be the very safe and in the pocket approach of Jimmy Page and Bonzo, really. Unlike previous albums, they're down in the mix just a little bit too much for me. All right, next track up, 
Fool in the Rain. You know, this is my favorite track on this album, bar none. To my ears, this song could fit so very easily on the magnificent Houses of the Holy. And you know, on this track, Bonzo does a bit of shining. He is so deadly accurate on this song, and it is a needed deadly accuracy for this type of style of song. Once again, at least until about 2 minutes and 25 seconds, Jimmy's too far down in the mix, but after that, he does some very interesting soloing here. It's almost reminiscent of Jeff Beck. It doesn't sound unlike some of the solos we heard on Jeff Beck's magnificent Wired album, as well as his great Blow by Blow. Just this little bit of soloing and Jimmy's whole approach is probably his shining moment on this album. He had never played quite like this before, and it sounds wonderful. And you know, really, if you think about it, Fool in the Rain is the perfect prelude to track number four, the very next track, Hot Dog. Here we have another Led Zeppelin Smokehouse classic, right deep down south kind of rub against me, baby Smokehouse blues tune. I love it. And you know Jimmy's guitar playing here? At first I thought it was kind of sloppy when I first heard it, and then I started comparing it to some Memphis tracks. Man, you have to go to Memphis, Tennessee to even hear that kind of approach to guitar playing. That almost, oops, I almost missed it, kind of slide into it and end it on a perfect note as well as a perfect beat. Isn't that wonderful? But once again, I have to say, he's brought way too far down in the mix for my my taste. All right, so that gets us to side two, track one, Carousel Ombra. Now, it's interesting with this song because so many people seem to really choose this song as either their favorite song on the album or one of their very favorite songs on the album. And it's a fine track. Led Zeppelin didn't record bad music ever. But it's not one of my favorite tracks on the album. Again, Jimmy being really just pushed down in the mix way too much. And I don't know, the song almost sounds prefabricated, like it was written to sound like this new sound that was emerging, the sound we would call the 80s. Don't get me wrong, the fact that Led Zeppelin was nothing like the 80s bands would be later on, it is interesting how they latch on to this sound. And at four minutes and 10 seconds, the whole song slows down and Jimmy comes to the fore for a while. Now, one of the problems with this song for me is how far down Robert Plant's vocals are here. You know, when I read the lyrics and hear him sing, I have trouble following along with them. Now, they've brought Robert's voice down in the mix on previous albums, but never to the point that you can't clearly hear what he's singing. And, of course, once again, Jimmy Page is far too far down in the mix. But at 4 minutes and 20 seconds, the whole song slows down, and for the first time, Jimmy Page's presence is very well up front. The only problem is, it's all stuff that Jimmy Page could play quite safely. Once again, him serving the song not letting the song serve him. It's almost like he's in the mentality of his pre-Zeppelin days, like he's back in the studio providing exactly what the writers need or the producer wants. In this case, supplying Robert and John Paul Jones what they want in their production. And to my ears, Jimmy, their producer, isn't producing this album at all. This album's being produced, in my opinion, by John Paul Jones. Not to say that that's wrong, but I guess I've always felt that Led Zeppelin's magic came from a slight dominance of Page and Plant songs with just the right mix from JPJ and Bonzo, right? At 7.01 in this recording, John Paul Jones shows off with a very 60s sounding keyboard. And even as late as 8.05 in 
in this track, Bonzo delivers some of his most amazing chops and perhaps the very best chops on this album. All right, so that leads us to the second track on side two, and that of course is All My Love. You know, this is also one of my favorite tracks on this album, and that's probably just because it's just such a perfect single, isn't it? It's infectious as hell. It's still to this day constantly played on the radio and for many. And you know, I believe rightfully so. This song was their very favorite song on this album. Often it would be hearing this song on the radio that brought in such great sales for the band. And you know, to that all I can say is, holy pre-honey drippers, Batman. This song sounds and really is the track that kind of announces Robert Plant's solo career and not for the only time on this album. And of course, I'm talking about the wonderful I'm Gonna Crawl. What a beautiful and schmaltzy intro JPJ supplies on this song. And you know, this kind of intro was starting to hit into pop radio, showing us that John Paul Jones had his finger on what was happening in the music industry, no doubt. But you know, this track also shows us that Robert Plant is quite aware of where the band needs to go and how to update their sound. Now this song is credited to Jones, Plant and Page. But you know, I hear Jones and Plant on here. I don't hear a lot of Jimmy influence on this song. And once again, in my opinion, seems to be approaching this song just like he would have approached another song in his studio years at 19 years of age. Give them what they want. And if there is a weakness to this excellent and wonderful song, I would say that's where it lies. But you know, to my ears, this is a Herald song, again, to Robert's upcoming solo career. And this song sounds very familiar to me in approach to the wonderful a ship of fools. All right, so my final analysis. If you remember, when I started this video, I said Led Zeppelin's excellent album. Now, out of the eight studio albums that Led Zeppelin released, the first seven albums, to me, are masterpieces. This one does not quite rise to that level. It is an excellent album. It reminds me of some of the stuff that the police would do in the future on Zenyatta Mandata. And if Led Zeppelin had been able to continue on into the 80s, this album might sit more easily to my ears if I had had some sort of future reference as to where they were going. But you know, even if Bonzo had lived, that probably wasn't going to happen. Jimmy and Bonzo had already agreed that the next Led Zeppelin album was going to be a heavy, guitar-centric, drum-centric album. So I don't think they would have gone in this direction. And so with all of those thoughts, it seems to me that this album sits kind of uncomfortably in Led Zeppelin's canon, right? But you know, that gives Led Zeppelin not only seven masterpieces, but seven masterpieces in a row, right? And two excellent final albums, an accomplishment that in my opinion, not even the Beatles could match that level of material staying that high. So it is no cut down to this album when I say that it sits uncomfortably in Led Zeppelin's canon. Mm -hmm. 